Do you guys need another minute? You ready? Why don't you guys just turn to each other for a second and share some of the things that are standing out to you in the passage. Let's come back together. Why don't some of you share with us what are, what are some of the things you're talking about? What's standing out to you in the Genesis 3 story? Say that again. Why it didn't bother her? She was having a conversation with a snake. <laughs> Did you talk to the badger earlier? Was Cliff's question. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, some of it's about right the the nature of Genesis and how it's written in the style of literature it is. But I, it is funny. She is talking to a snake. She doesn't seem to have a problem with it. Yeah. Apparently, with the conversation, she was aware of this instruction, but the fact that Adam didn't, A, instruct her further, or basically, because he was standing there, based on the passage, right next to her. 
Mm. Or whatever, hip to hip or whatever. It's like grab her hand and run. Uh-huh. It's like, get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that we don't really know, you know, what's going on there. Adam is strangely quiet in the way that the writer has told the story, but there's a sense that maybe something got lost in translation from this command that Adam had given, that they could eat freely from any tree in the garden except this one, when we see the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? He, we'll talk about this some more later, but God comes walking in the garden and he calls out to, to Adam, where are you? Like, God didn't know where he was. <laughs> like, God's aware of what's happened. You know, there's something going on in that interaction between them. Over here in the back. Yeah, I don't know, but I found that very interesting, just looking at the text, that it's not until after they've eaten the fruit and God has described the curse now, the repercussions of that sin, that then Adam takes this kind of authoritative role of naming Eve. I don't, I don't know what that means exactly, but I, I noticed that too in the passage. Yeah, so he, he doesn't really engage the serpent in like why he's done what he's done, right? I, that's something I think we're going to talk about a little bit. A couple more? Okay. All right. Interesting. A couple more? Yeah, yeah, we've all been there, haven't we? You get caught doing something wrong. I mean, who's like, yeah, I totally did that. I'm a jerk, and I did that. You know, they're like, no, she did it. No, he did it. No, I didn't do it. They did it. There's this, there's no immediate repentance. He said it's blaming. Okay, a couple more over here, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I think it's still a reference to the Trinity. So remember earlier in, in um, the other chapters, he said, let us make them in our image, you know? And it's a sense of the, the community of the Trinity that's present. And I, I think it's, he's still making that reference there. Okay. His theory is that maybe he picked her to persuade first because she might be able to persuade him. <laughs> so that's interesting. The other thing is at the end, um, talk about picking them out of the garden so that they can't live forever. So there's this thing of us being designed originally to live forever. Mm-hmm. We were made for eternity, right? But now exiled from the place where God's presence is and the tree of life, there's a limitedness to our life. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start there. I'm going to just pray for us, and then I'll get started. God, thank you so much um, for the chance to be in this book, and Lord, for already what you've taught us in just this one last week about how you made us, God, and the world, what your intentions were. And we pray, God, that you would open our hearts to you as we come to this really tragic piece of scripture. God, would you reveal yourself to us again this morning and turn our hearts towards you, Lord. Amen. Yeah, really, Genesis 3, just going off of that last comment, is this is a cautionary tale, right? <laughs> Genesis 1 and 2, I felt really good reading those chapters. And then it gets to Genesis 3, and I feel like we're at, like, 
threat level orange now, <laughs> code red, you know, like there's something very cautionary about this story for us. I also think it reveals to us what even today is at the root of all of our straying from God. I think we see that here in Genesis 3. And finally, I was, I was surprised to, to realize, and I, I honestly, I overlooked it. it. It came out in a conversation I had with Brian, um, that this passage reveals another thing to us that is a good part of paradise, maybe a gift that God wanted to give us. And um, I don't know if I've ever seen it that way before. So we'll look at th- these three sections in the text today. We'll look at the conflict, the conversation between the serpent and the woman, And then we'll look at the conversation. What was it that really transpired in the conversation that really changed everything? And then we'll spend some time looking at the consequences. What has become of us now as a result of what's happened in this passage? So let's start with the conflict. You know, when the serpent enters the picture, I'm I'm tempted, and most of the people that I've been reading, preparing for this, you know, we see the serpent enter the conversation and we just think it's all bad now that he's in the picture. From the very beginning, this is not a good thing that she's talking to the snake. And one of the first things that we sort of discover in this passage is maybe that part of life in paradise is conflict. That maybe this conflict that's happening in the conversation between doubt and faith is actually a good part of paradise, something that God put in the garden for us. There's this serpent there who is made by God, put in the garden by God, and allowed to go and have a conversation with Adam and Eve about the tree. There's no sense that he snuck in somehow, (laughs) unseen by God, into the garden. And maybe God intended for the conflict between doubt and trust, between doubt and faith to be a part of our life. The conversation itself, the conversation that they're having is not a problem in the text. The doubt that we see Eve and Adam wrestle with is not a sin. There's a sense maybe that the wrestling with doubt is good for us, especially when in the end we choose faith. God wanting us to have that experience of putting the opportunity in the garden for us to have the conflict to wrestle and to struggle and to then in the end prevail. I mean, we compete in all kinds of ways in life, right, because we like the thrill of prevailing, of winning, don't we? I mean, just think of something like video games. I'm not a video game player, but I was at this little pizza joint the other night waiting for a calzone. Crystal, my roommate, was there with me, and they had one of those old-school arcade games there. We were like, oh, what's this, you know? And I look and they have Donkey Kong on it. I'm like, oh, Donkey Kong. It's only like 25 cents, I've got a couple quarters, I pop one in, I'm like trying to remember how to play Donkey Kong with the big, you know, joystick and the buttons, you know, and, and I only get like two levels up, Jumpman, you know, Mario, and, and I get pummeled by a barrel on my head, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is not satisfying, you know, I pull out another quarter and I pop it in, and <laughs> it's not okay, like I want to win, and I, pretty soon I'm like digging in my purse, and I'm like, you know, we like that feeling of winning. We design, we, it's why we love sports. It's why we love to watch sports. It's why we love to play sports. Because of the struggle and the thrill of prevailing in the end. I mean, think of something like the marathon for existence. I mean, what else is a marathon for if not to struggle and in the end hopefully prevail? I mean, the race is 26.22 miles. It's the distance that really tests the limits of the human physiology to test physically and mentally to see if you can make it. And it's, it's so, I mean, have you ever watched like a marathon or watched someone run it or heard someone talk about being in a marathon? I watched this one documentary about it, The Spirit of the Marathon last year. And um, they're talking about the history of the marathon and just how hard it is. And you're watching people, and in the early 1900s, they still wouldn't let women run it. And they actually cited one of the reasons why women shouldn't be allowed to run it is because the race was so strenuous, they thought their uterus might fall out if they were like (laughs) in the, because it was such a hard thing on you physically, right? I mean, you're watching, you're watching people run and they're fainting as their, like their body is giving out, they're running and they're like slumping over and their eyes are barely open and they're like falling over on the side of the road trying to accomplish this feat of running a marathon. They're getting injured and hurt, and and people are devastated when they get hurt and they can't finish the marathon. 
And they start recouping and training to be able to do it again the next year. This one elderly gentleman in the, in the, in the uh, documentary, he said that when you cross the finish line for the first time, no matter how fast or how slow, it changes you forever. And this one college student wrote on his blog about his experience running the Boston Marathon in 2005, and this is what he said about it. When my friends found me after I'd completed the 2005 Boston Marathon, I was exhausted and disoriented. My armpits were chafed, my body ached, and I desperately needed to move my bowels. Salt was caked on my face from all the dried sweat, and shortly after stumbling into my friend's apartment, I ate an entire key lime pie and an entire bag of Doritos. <laughs> I could tell something was wrong with me, but I didn't really know what. I also didn't know if the damage I'd inflicted on my body was permanent. The next morning, I had a low-grade fever, diffused muscle spasms, and I had to take a taxi to school that day. One of my classmates, a former college sprinter, he had run the marathon on a whim without training and told me that he had spent the entire evening peeing blood. Neither of us could navigate a flight of stairs unassisted. We were both a mess, as were most of our classmates who had run the race, but we were a proud mess, is what he said. There is something about struggle, the gift of being able to struggle and in the end to prevail. We get it. We're drawn to it. It does something in us. And that maybe this struggle between doubt and faith, the chance to have your faith questioned and to have to struggle with that and wrestle with that, maybe that was a gift that God had put in the garden. And if we ignore our doubt or we give in to the idea that somehow doubt is sinful or not Christian or maybe we give in to our doubt too quickly, then there's a chance that we are going to miss something deep and strong and beautiful about God and our life with him. This conflict between doubt and faith is meant to give us the experience of prevailing in faith, of prevailing with God. To know the feeling of having overcome this dragon that breathes in our hearts and our minds, and on the other side, to know God in some greater way and to trust him more deeply. I mean, have you ever had an experience of doubt? Some conflict in your heart that comes up that makes you question God. For me, when I was, <clears throat> I think I was about 23, I'd just come on staff with InterVarsity. I um, was on this short-term trip to Mexico City and um, walking down the sidewalk actually with Brian and we're talking about some stuff and he makes this statement to me. He says, you know, Stacy, there's probably about a 50-50% chance that you're ever actually going to get married. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Why would you say something like that to me, you know? And I kind of laugh nervously, and I'm like, what do you mean, you know? And we go on to have this conversation and talk about the reasons why, and, and I understood what he was saying. And, but, but that comment, it sparked something in me. It sparked some questions in me that I didn't actually know were in my heart towards God. A wrestling over what it meant to be single to live a life for the kingdom. And did I really trust God with that? And so I was encouraged one day to go spend some time in a prayer room, so I went for a few hours just to, to have a conversation with the Lord about being single. And um, we had a couple significant conversations during that time. Um, one of them had to do with him challenging me about you know, this feeling that singles have a lot of times about just waiting and putting off, doing something great for the kingdom until the ideal circumstances are present in their life, what we view as ideal circumstances. And, and that was a really, he really said some stuff to me in that conversation, but it was towards the end of the prayer time, and I was still there, and I still felt like maybe there was something else God was wanting to do. And so I was, I was praying, and I began to just do this kind of prayer exercise to try and listen to the Lord. And I closed my eyes, and when I closed my eyes, I saw myself sitting in a room. It was just white, it was completely empty, and there were two chairs there in the room. And I was sitting in one, and sitting just a foot or two in front of me was the Lord. And I've, it's the only time I've really had an experience like this in particular in prayer. And, and I just, I felt peaceful sitting there in front of him, and I had a stack of boxes behind my chair. And um, I began to pick up those boxes. They represented the things that I was worried about in life, the things that I was anxious about. And I began to pick them up one by one, and 
to just name the box and just say what it was and to begin to hand them to him and just say, God, would you just take care of this? I trust you, would you just take care of this thing in my life? And I'm sure it was everything from drama that was happening in my family to stuff that was happening in my job as I worked with college students and was trying to plant and doing a horrible job at it and probably stuff related to my finances because I was definitely living on a prayer, if you know what I mean, <laughs> when I first came on staff. But it was easy. I would pick it up and I would name it and I would hand it to him and it just it was moving along and he was put, taking these boxes from me with just this loving kind of presence and putting them behind his chair. And as I went through this exercise, I got to the last box and I put it in my lap. And as I was watching this happen, as I was imagining this, I knew immediately what this box represented. It represented my singleness, my future. And this one didn't go quickly. I put it there in my lap and for the first time I hesitated. And I heard these words coming out of my heart. God, I actually don't want to give you this one because I'm afraid if I give it to you, you'll never give it back to me. And that confession, it hung there in the air. And on the surface, it just seemed like I was afraid that God wasn't going to give me what I wanted, but beneath that was doubt. Beneath that was doubt. Did God really care about my future? Did God really know what was best for me? Would he look out for me? Would he provide meaningful community in my life? And did I really believe that in Jesus, God had made me a whole and a complete person that could run quickly, relentlessly after his mission as a single woman? The question was, did I really trust God? Did I believe that God knew what was best for me? Or did I know what was best? And as I sat there quietly in front of the Lord, I don't, I don't hear him this clearly often, but with all gentleness, he answered back to me, you're right, you don't know. And I was like, that's not what I was looking for. <laughs> what? <laughs> it wasn't like, yes, I will, or it's going to be fine, it's going to work out. It was like, yeah, you don't. You don't know. There was, it wasn't certainty that he was giving me in that conversation. He was calling me to trust him. And immediately, just like flashes of memory, he began to remind me of these major milestones in my life where I had struggled to trust him with something. I'd come out of this long three and a half year convoluted relationship before I moved to Tampa that I knew wasn't good for me, but I was in love with this guy and I didn't want to leave it behind. And it was so hard to get out of that and to trust God. And, and, and he showed me that and then he showed me what my life was like and how incredible the life was that he had given me since that decision. And he reminded me about when I was trying to figure out whether I should go on staff with a varsity or not. And I was a planner growing up. I knew what I was going to do with my future, and I'd gone straight into my degree, and I had jobs waiting for me. People, five jobs, calling me and saying, will you come work for us when I was about to graduate? And I was so scared to say yes to Jesus' call to come on staff. And he, he reminded me of that struggle and of how incredible it was to be able to be a part of seeing college students come to know Jesus. And just, just like a flood of memories. And I was sitting there in tears, and all of a sudden, with ease, my heart said, of course I can trust you. That wrestling has produced something in me that has lasted. These 11, 12 years later, I have this strong sense that my life belongs to God that he is good, that he is trustworthy. And even now, when I doubt and I wonder about my future, I go back to that conversation, I go back to that wrestling, and it has produced something beautiful and strong and lasting in my life with him. I remember how God won out over my doubts. I think one of the greatest gifts that comes from entering into the conflicts between our doubt 
and our faith. It's not about gaining in certainty of a particular answer. It's about gaining in the certainty of the very nature of God's character, of his goodness, of his love towards his children. It is about gaining trust in the one who has made us and knows what he has made us for. I think this gift, as we wrestle with doubt and faith, it brings deeper intimacy with God. Like any relationship, right? When a conflict is entered into in a meaningful way and you have it out and you come out on the other side together, it brings a deeper understanding of the other. It brings a deeper commitment to the other. It brings a deeper trust in the other. It brings a joy and a freedom in that relationship that cannot exist in a relationship that has not entered into and overcome conflict. God gave us conflict in the paradise so that we could experience prevailing in relationship with him. The conflict in the garden, the doubt, that is not shameful. Having the conversation with the serpent was not wrong. It was not sinful. Doubt isn't what causes them to cover themselves and hide. So what is it exactly that transpires in this conversation then? If the conflict is good, if that's a gift that God has given us, what is it? that transpires in the conversation between the serpent and the woman that changes everything. There is a move from doubt to acting out of that doubt, to acting out of suspicion that is planted in the conversation that begins to change the way that they see God. Have you ever had this happen? Have you ever had someone say something to you that like plants suspicion in your mind about someone else? They're coming, they're like, can you believe this person said this thing about you? And they kind of make that facial expression that puts a certain feeling into the conversation. And you're like, what? They said what? Like, that person's my friend. I know them. Have you ever had that happen to you before? And all of a sudden now you're suspicious of this person. And you're like, what? I thought, what? No, I know them. They, they said what? And they cast doubt, right, over that relationship. I remember once when I was younger, I, I don't, I don't, I've been nervous to share this because I don't want to shame my parents in any way, but I remember, um, well, just to give you a little bit of background, my dad, when I was young, until about the time I was about seven, my dad was, he struggled with alcoholism, and it created a lot of kind of chaos in our lives, and when I was four, my mom and my dad got a divorce because of it, and um, so he used to come and pick us up on the weekends and a week at Christmas and a couple weeks in the summer so that we could spend time with him. And I loved getting to see my dad, and I always looked forward to those trips and being with him. And he was a hunter, and I would get up at like 4 in the morning, and he would make me coffee, and I would hang out with him before he, you know, went on hunting trips. And I remember a few years later after the divorce, I was with my mom having a conversation. I think I may have been in the sixth grade, and she probably doesn't even remember saying this, and she'd probably just feel so bad to know she said this and the impact it had on me. But I remember we were talking about something, and... She made this statement. She said, you know, the only reason your dad used to come pick you up when you were little was because his mom made him. Not because he wanted to. And um, we went on with the conversation, but that, that statement, it cast a cloud of suspicion over my heart towards my dad for a few years. I had to really wrestle with, really? Because I had all these good memories of being with my dad and us having good times together, and really? You really think he didn't come because he wanted to, because someone made him? And You know, he was wrestling with alcoholism, so I thought, I guess that's possible. I guess, you know, I don't know, but I just, I wrestled for a few years, you know. How how would I act towards my dad now that this suspicion was present in my heart? Would I trust who I knew my dad to be, and when I, would I saw him, would I act from a place of trust and love? and belief that my dad loved me? Or when I saw him, would I act out of a place of doubt and suspicion towards his his heart for me? And I actually remember I had, there was this really key moment when I was about 13, um, when my dad and my stepmom sat my brother and I down at the dinner table to tell us that they were gonna have a baby. And it's so strange because I was so young, but I remember having this clear moment sitting at the table where I knew I had a choice to make about how I would respond to that, no, that news. Would I let the suspicion in my heart about whether my dad had loved me the way that I thought he had create jealousy in my heart and make me upset and wonder if we were gonna be replaced? 
Or would I celebrate with them and believe in the love that my dad had for us, even though we didn't get to live with him? And I, know that I knew the choice was to celebrate. And I think choosing from that place of trust, it did something in me for, for years to come. I know that my dad loves me. I don't doubt that. He always has. But this happens to us, doesn't it? Someone says something and it cal- casts some kind of doubt in us, some kind of suspicion. And now we have a choice to make. Do we act out of the suspicion or do we act out of trust? So what's happening in this conversation at the tree, the doubt is becoming a suspicion about God's intentions towards them. The subtle turning of words and the tinge of negative emotion associated with those words. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, no, we can eat from, we can eat from every tree, just not the one in the middle, but we can't even touch it or we'll die. She adds to God's words, we can't even touch it or we'll die, making his command seem more severe than it really was. And in this conversation, the scope of God's gift and his command to freely eat from every tree in the garden, including the one that gives eternal life, it now becomes eclipsed by this tree looming in front of them. Instead of it being a boundary that was for their good to keep them from death and provide a chance for them to choose intimacy with God, they start to wonder if there was some kind of hidden treasure in this tree that God was trying to keep from them. And strangely, the character of God that had been known as totally generous and totally present, absolutely for them, loving and good, is now seeming prohibitive and sly and withholding. And it's out of this place of suspicion and lack of trust for God's goodness that they eat and forever change the landscape of our life with God. In the end, they chose suspicion instead of trust, doubt instead of faith. The doubt is not the problem. It's the choice made out of doubt. It's when we choose to act out of suspicion about God's motives instead of acting out of faith and trust in his character that the problem begins. That is where sin enters the picture. And this choice that they made out of this conversation, it has had severe consequences. As they took the fruit and they ate it, the great human crisis ensued. This crisis was very personal to Adam and Eve, but it was universal as it reverberates through the ages. Its tremor is still wavering deep in our souls today. Mel McGay, the, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her, right, her name right, but um, the, the Filipina theologian Melba McGay, I've been doing some of her reading, and um, in a moment I'll share with you some things that she says about it. But what they thought would make them like God, knowing good from evil, it happened. One of the things the servant says to them is, if you eat this, the problem is if you eat this, God knows you'll be like him and you'll know good from evil. And then we see God repeat that at the end of the passage, and he says, they have become like one of us. They do know good and evil. But the impact of that knowledge and the power and the independence and their self-assertion, the impact that it had was not what they thought it would be. Even in the writing, we notice the shift. Because as God comes walking through the garden, there's this image of the God who, in the first two chapters, just with the, the tone and the breath of his voice, hung the world in the universe. This God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hear him, his foot, walking across the grass, and he calls out to them. And then the language turns because he says, where are you? And and Adam says, I, you know, I heard you, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And what was about God and intimacy with God now becomes about him. I was, heard you. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid. This is what Moa McGay writes about what happened in that moment. Eve trusts her own unaided senses only to find that her eyes are open not to the larger mysteries of the world up until now experienced to be good, but to the shrinking knowledge of her nakedness in a universe now seen in shame and guilt. Instead of enlargement, there was a narrowing of vision. Adam and Eve turned inward, and they saw not the world, but themselves. Self-consciousness, that tortured watching of oneself as it relates, relates to others, has been the baneful legacy of a neurotic generations that have since succeeded them. By a thousand inhibitions and indecisions, we dissemble to gain time, 
to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. The frantic makeshift of sewing fig leaves together was a desperate improvisation against the loss of security and confidence in the presence of a God who sees all. With disobedience came the impulse to hide with guilt, the fear of facing a God whose utter purity is a reproach. Terror seized our forebears as it does us now at the mere sound of his steps. The note of anguish in the cry, where are you? It's a, a measure of the dislocation of the distance of our wanderings and alienation from the God who seeks us still. In the beginning, evil was a threat outside of us that we could understand only intellectually as the warning hung in the air. On that day that you eat from this tree, you will surely die. It was a reality out there like some mysterious country yet to be discovered. But not comfortable with his intellectual knowledge of evil, man put forth his hand like a child wanting to get near the fire to see if it would really burn, and the experience seared him. From then on, he knew through sweat and sorrow the awful intimacy of evil. As they ate that fruit, there was an exchange made that day. Intimacy with God had now been traded for an awful intimacy with evil. For the first time ever, when they hear God walking in the garden, instead of running to him, they run away from him. They hide from God and they sew fig leaves together to cover themselves so that they can hide from each other. And then when, Jesus call, or when God calls out to them, where are you? It's as if he's giving them a chance to come clean. Where are you, Adam? For the first time, he's not found in the place where he was meant to be. And in a moment when he could have come clean, he says, I hid. God says, what did you do? Did you eat from the tree? And he said, well, it was that woman that you gave me, God. The woman that you made and put here. She gave me the fruit. And so he turns to Eve and gives her a chance to come clean. Eve, what have you done? And she's like, it was that serpent. He came and he said these things to me. In this moment of human crisis, hiding and blame become the norm for us. Dan Allender, in his book, Leading with a Limp, he, he talks about what happens to leaders in moments of crisis. And he describes a crisis this way. He says, a crisis is more than a mere threat. It presents the danger of ruin. A windstorm that might knock over a tree or impede travel for a few hours, that's not a crisis. But a hurricane that might flatten neighborhoods and kill residents is a crisis that can bring total ruin. Compounding the danger is the shame that often follows this. He says there are two elements to crisis, danger and shame. Danger because of the threat of punishment, of being found out, having others see our weaknesses or discover that we are not as competent as we want to appear to be. And that danger, it causes us to hide. Shame because when we are found out and our vulnerabilities are exposed, our mistakes and our willful choosing to cut corners and to lie and to cheat and to do the wrong thing is now out there for the world to see. And the shame is a trigger for us to blame. Hiding and blaming, they are ways that we lie to each other and to ourselves in response to the crisis of sin in our lives. We lie so that we can appear to be more than we are, so that we can appear to be different than we are. And we all do it. We all lie, right? And we kind of like lying to ourselves, in fact. I mean, have you ever tried to take a personality test online? Like, friends like, oh, you should take this personality test. And you go and you start to take it. But you kind of read, like, all the possible outcomes first, you know? Even though you know you probably shouldn't. You're, like, reading them. And you're kind of getting a sense, like, ooh, that one. That, that's probably mine, you know? And so you start the questions, and if there are multiple questions that you could see at one time, you're scanning them to kind of see, what's, what are they getting at in this test? What's the pattern here, you know? And you start clicking away, and you're feeling good, and you get your results, and you're like, oh, I love this. You get the results you want, right? And you show it to your friends, and they're like, what? You're like, that's not you. <laughs> it's so hard, though, because we... We want to answer based more on the person that we want to be and wish that we were than the person that we actually are. This, this guy who wrote a book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, his whole premise is that we all lie all the time. And um, 
He tells this story by him taking an online test to tell him what car would be a good car for him. So he goes through and he answers a series of questions about his life and what he does on a regular basis. And at the end, he spits out an answer and it says, the car for you is a Ford Taurus. And he's like, what? No, that's not the car for me. So he goes back to the test and he starts changing his answers, you know. And at the end, he changes them until it spits out and says, a small convertible is the right car for you. He's like, yes, that's the car for me. We do it. We all lie. We like to lie to ourselves. And have you ever told a little lie to maybe make yourself seem, I don't know, better than you are or to get away with something? And it seems innocent, but then you realize you have to like tell more lies to keep that lie going. <laughs> and you just have to keep doing it. In his book, he shares this story about him and a friend. They're at the airport, and the lines are really long, and they're trying to get somewhere overseas. And um, they're, they're overseas, and they're trying to get to another country. And so his friend's like, uh, you know, what if I was in a wheelchair? Would that help us? <laughs> So they're like, hmm, my wheelchair, that's a good idea. So they, the, Dan, Ali, this guy, he goes and finds a wheelchair and his friend gets in it and they go up to the place and they get through like this, through security. You know, they're just moving along. But um, he gets through security and the guy in the wheelchair realizes, I gotta go to the bathroom. And, uh, but if I get out of the chair, they're gonna know I'm not, I don't have a problem walking, you know? So he's like, listen, man, I'm gonna need you to wheel me up to the stall. And um, they didn't, I don't think they had a, uh, urinals or whatever. So he wheels him up and it won't really go in the stall. And so he just like aims from the wheelchair. He's like. <laughs> trying to go to the bathroom. So they get through with that and they get through and they wheel over to the gate and they're there and they're hanging out and it's time to get on the plane. And his friend wheels him onto the plane. But as soon as they get on the plane, they realize the wheelchair is too wide. It won't fit down the aisle. But if he gets up now, all the flight attendants are there. And they're going to know, like, he's not injured. It's not true. So he looks at his friend. So his friend hoists him up on his back. <laughs> and they're, like, at aisle 30 or something. He's, like, dragging him <laughs> to his seat and puts him down. And the guy in the wheelchair is actually becoming frustrated at this point. He's like, what the heck is wrong with this airline? Like. I can't get in the bathroom, I can't get down the aisle. He, I mean, he's just like, it's growing. So by the time they get to the place they're going to and they get off the plane, he drags them back down the aisle, he puts them in the wheelchair, and he's, so, he's like indignant. He's like, I cannot believe they're not more sensitive to handicapped people. I can't get anywhere. <laughs> so he gets his friend to wheel him to the airline office so he can complain. And he's in there for like just 15 or 20 minutes, just like ranting, like, and I tried to do this, and I tried to go to the bat, and your aisles aren't wide enough, and I can't believe you're so insensitive to handicapped people. Just, he'd done it so long, it was like, he felt like, gosh, I, you know, I'm mad. <laughs> so they wheeled over to baggage claim, and he got his luggage, and he stood up, and he walked out of the airport. <laughs> The awful truth is, is that sometimes we hide and we shift blame so much that we start to believe our own lies about ourselves. It's hard for us to face the depravity of our own hearts and our own minds. And, and so we begin to sew fig leaves together and to put on a face that the world can receive. And, and, and we do it so long, sometimes we kind of begin to believe it, that I'm not really that bad. My sin isn't real. I'm basically a good person, you know? To use the words of John Ortberg from his book, Love Beyond Reason, this is my story. I hide because I don't want to be exposed in my fallenness and my brokenness. I hide because I'm afraid that if the truth about me is known, I will never be loved. I hide from other people, I hide from God, I hide from truth, and in a sense, I hide from myself. And the irony is that we hide because we are afraid our true self will not be loved, but whatever is hidden has no chance of being loved. 
As long as we hide ourselves from each other and from God, the thing we most want, which is to be accepted for who we really are, to be loved, even in our weakness, there's no chance of it happening as long as we hide and we blame. And so desperately, we need for our lives to be marked by humility and vulnerability, confession and repentance, both in community and with God, to come out of our hiding. There are so many consequences seen in this passage. As he comes and he describes the curses to them, and, and some commentators say that these are more descriptive rather than prescriptive. Prescriptive meaning God's will. We see God's will in Genesis 1 and 2, and yet he warned them, if you do this, you'll, you'll die. There'll be repercussions. There will be consequences. And he begins to describe those. And we see them. The struggle between the serpent and humans is ongoing. The struggle women now experience in a gift that was uniquely theirs, childbirth. The relationship with the man when he, for, who, when he first saw her, cried out, finally, one who is like me, an equal, a suitable partner. This relationship is now marked by power struggles. The struggle with work that was once a gift to co-create and lead has now turned into a straining and a striving that we all experience. And finally, the ability to exist in the presence of God that Adam and Eve had enjoyed for so long has been lost. And maybe this is the greatest consequence of all, and I'll begin to end with this if the worship team wants to come. Maybe the biggest consequence of all is we see it as they get exiled from the garden. The end of the story, he says, you know, they've become like us. And, and so he sends them away from the garden and he, he puts up a guard with a flaming sword to keep them out. And there has been something that has happened to them, something that has been done that cannot be undone. They have been marked by sin in a way that cannot be unmarked and so now there is a need for atonement. It's like, it's like a smell that you can't get rid of. Have you ever had something like that in your house before? I have dogs, so we often have a smell that we can't get rid of in our house. There's something there that lingers, and as much as you try, you just you, you scrub and you spray, and you like candles, and you can't get rid of it, you know? This week, Brian shared a story with me that he read in, in the book he was reading um, the power of habit about um, Febreze, you know, the cleaning spray, Febreze. There's a story in there about it because they were having trouble marketing it and they start to tell the, the history of this product. And um, the history of Febreze, you know, they, it was something really they stumbled upon, this cleaning product. There was a chemist that worked for Procter & Gamble and he was in the lab one day and um, he was working with this uh, particular substance. I probably can't pronounce it correctly. Hydroxpropyl beta cyclodextrin. I don't know. HPBCD. He was in there. He was in there working with this product. And um, he went home that night and he's a chronic smoker. And when he got to the door and his wife greeted him, she was like, you know, have you, did you stop smoking recently? And he looked at her and he was kind of confused because she was always nagging him to stop smoking. And so he thought, what is this, like reverse psychology or something? Like, have you stopped smoking? She's like, well, no, it's just that today you don't smell like smoke at all. I don't really understand. So he thought that was interesting. So we went back to the lab the next day and the substance he'd been working with, he began to test it. And by the end of the day, he had hundreds of vials containing fabrics that were smelled like wet dogs and cigars and sweaty socks and Chinese food and gross shirts and dirty towels. And, he would put them in these vials and then he would put a little bit of water in this HPBCD in there. And um, what they discovered is that this molecule that they were working with, it wouldn't just cover an odor, it would literally draw the odor inside of the molecule and eradicate it. Nothing had ever been found like it before. Everything else was a spray that would cover it up or, you know, kind of mask it for a little while. But they were discovering that it would actually take the odor inside of the molecule and get rid of it, totally eradicate it. It was so advanced that NASA eventually began to use it to clean out the shuttles when they would return from missions. 
And so they began to put samples together and they decided to put it out in a test market. So they began to send it out to cities and ask people, use this in your house and then can we come to your house afterwards and see what happened? And so one day they um, went to the house of this woman. She was like a parks and recreation worker. And she always was having to go out and rescue animals and deal with animals like coyotes and um, I don't remember all the things that they talked about, but one of the things, one of the animals was skunks. She was always dealing with skunks in her job. And they were often spraying her and like covering her in the smell of skunk. And it was so bad, her whole house smelled like it. Her furniture smelled like it, bed felt, smelled like it, her clothes smelled like it. And um, so they came and they came to her house and and um, she was talking to them and she was just kind of telling them, like, this is my problem, this is why I used your product. I always smell like skunk. And she was like, I, I think I'm a pretty attractive woman, you know, I'm, but I go out on dates and I'm always self-conscious. I wonder, like, do they smell the skunk? Like, I get a whiff of it and I think, oh my God, they probably smell it, right? And, She's like, there's actually this really nice guy. I've been out on a date with him like four times now, but I keep, I don't want to invite him over to my place because I'm afraid like as soon as I do. So she finally works up the courage after the fourth date to invite him over. They have decent conversation. And um, the next day she gets a call from him and just says, you know, I think we need to take a little break. And um, I mean, it's like ruining her, <laughs> her dating life because she just smells like scum. So the researchers are sitting there listening to her and, and he says, oh, well, you know, I'm glad you got to try f our product, Febreze, wh what did you think of it? And she started crying. And she's like, I just have to thank you because this product has changed my life. <laughs> she's like, I, I got it and I sprayed everything. She's like, I sprayed my whole couch, I sprayed my bedspread. You know, I sprayed my jeans. I sprayed, I ran out of it. I sprayed so much stuff in my house. So I went and got another bottle and I came back and I finished spraying my house. She's like, I'm inviting my friends over to try it out. I've been inviting them over and they're telling me they can't smell anything anymore. And by this point, she's crying so hard. The researcher's like patting her on the shoulder, you know, like, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. And she literally says like, um, I feel so free. What happened that day in the garden, it marked us. And there is nothing that we can do to remove the foul stench that sin has left on our lives. Nothing, no amount of effort, no amount of work. We can't scrub it out. And now there is a need for atonement. There is a need for Jesus. This is the moment when Jesus becomes the sacrifice. It is only him who can take what sin has done to us into his own crucified body and not just cover it up for a little while, but eradicate it, totally. We see him in this passage, he's there, he's present. He's the one who will come eventually and crush the serpent's head. As they've tried to sow fig leaves for themselves, God takes an animal, it's the first sacrifice that we see, and he makes better clothes for them out of animal skin to begin covering their shame. Jesus has been in the story since the beginning, but now it's necessary for him to become an atoning sacrifice. He becomes the place in which we hide the one who willingly takes the blame for us. Colossians 3 says, for you have died and your life is now hidden in God, through Jesus. Galatians 3, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. For all who, of you who are baptized into Christ have now clothed yourself with him. The reason that we even need clothes is because of this passage in Genesis, because for the first time, we know what it is to feel shame. And Jesus now is becoming the one who covers our shame. It is his righteousness that we clothe ourselves with. And if I'm honest, I really want this story to end on a 
high note because I, I, I just, you know, like the horrible movie that you watch, you, you want it to wrap up well at the end. And there is hope because Jesus is here in this story and, and he is the sacrifice for us. But the truth is, this is a sad story. It is a melancholy tale. We are a people living in exile and the longings that we experience inside of us every day for a better life, a better world, a better self, a better relationship with God. They are the longings of a people who once dwelled in a place that was inhabited daily by the fullness of the presence of God and who now live outside of that place and we long for it. We're trying to find a way to get back in. I don't know what the call is for you today I'll make a couple of suggestions and I'm going to pray for us and have Brian come up and do communion. But I don't know, maybe there's some way that God is calling you to come out of hiding in your life today. Maybe there's sin that is wrecking you and you're hiding and covering that up. And maybe he's calling you today to find people that you can entrust that brokenness to. You know, the table, it it represents this atonement that Jesus has made for us and the longing that we have for him to come and set the world right, to set us right. And I don't know, maybe it's appropriate for us to come today with an amount of grieving in our hearts for the broken state that we live in. To come with that longing as a prayer to him. To come and make things right. I'm just going to pray and have Brian come. God, my own heart is heavy this morning, Lord. Just over the brokenness, God, that has invaded our lives, that we wrestle against every day, Jesus, because of this essential choice that we fail at sometimes, Lord, to trust ourselves more than we trust you. To live our lives from a place of doubt and suspicion about your love for us, God, and your intentions towards us. And and Lord, we long for you to come this morning, Lord, and to wash, Lord, the residue of that, that sin and that rebellion, Lord, out of us, Lord. And God, we long for you to make us a people who, when we encounter the conflict that you gave us as a part of paradise, Lord, when we encounter doubt, that we would struggle, that we would wrestle, God, that you would make us a people who get to experience what it's like to prevail in choosing faith and choosing to believe you, God, that you do, you have made us and you do know what you've made us for. Love you this morning, Jesus. Romans 5 says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. We're all intimately acquainted with the sin of Adam. We carry it in our bones, in our DNA. We are his children, his offspring. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. This is our hope this morning. And you do still have in you the need to hide and the need to blame and this is the scandal of the cross and the gospel it is that Jesus comes into the world God takes human flesh and says you can hide in me you can hide 
behind me. I will take away your shame. I will be shame for you. And he says, you can blame me. I'll take your blame. It isn't about bucking up. It isn't about owning what you've done and saying, you know, I'll pay my own price. You can't pay your own price. You can't make it up to God, the things that you've done. This is the truth. This table, this God, is only for sinners, only for hiders and blamers, only for murderers and adulterers, only for truly desperate people. And if you just need a little help today from God, this isn't really the table for you. Jesus isn't the God for you. Go to a Tony Robbins seminar or something like that. Just get a little better. Encourage yourself. You don't know who Tony Robbins is. It's fine. It's not important. Don't go listen to Tony Robbins. That's my point, after all. Jesus is for the truly desperate, the truly broken, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And that's us. This is our story. And so we come to this table again this morning. We come desperate, needy. No matter how many times we come, we're still hungry because we're still broken. We still have failed, fallen short. The fall of man is our fall. It's not just some theological construct that we believe because we're Protestant, but it's something that we know in our souls. And I urge you, daughter of God, son of God, to come and find your hiding place in Jesus again this morning. Let him absorb your blame this morning. Clothe him. Let him clothe you in his righteousness, his goodness. And on that night he was betrayed. After giving thanks, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat it to remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink it to remember me. A broken body and spilled blood. That first animal that had to be sacrificed that day that they felt shame was a shadow of the one man, the true man, the second Adam who had come and let his body be broken for you so that you could be clothed with him, so that you could stand again in the presence of God, so that you could absorb again the paradise that God has for you. This is our hope. And if you'll come again this morning, he will give you life. So as the elders come forward, I want to just ask you to maybe reconnect with the heart of God for a minute and just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I do need you. And when you're ready, guys, just come forward to these uh, stations, the body and blood of Jesus given for you.